Father, we bless you. Tonight we've come that we may encounter you. Great God that you are moving this place. Feel the longing heart. Heal the sick in body. Lift up burdens. We bless your name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. First Samuel chapter 17. Like I said earlier, I wouldn't want to take so much time tonight. I'd really love it if I could close before the usual time. Last week we had a powerful teaching titled Healing a Broken Self-Image. Healing a Broken Self-Image. And um, today we trust God to continue in that teaching, but tonight I will title it Building a Healthy Self-Image. Building a Healthy Self-Image. Just play that chant on the keyboard, no need to sing. That's what I'm hearing in my spirit. Hallelujah. I will not review the teaching, but I recommend you find it online. Hallelujah. We observe that the perception that a man has of himself is of so much importance that when neglected, the consequence becomes immeasurable. That if the devil succeeds in unaltering your perception of who you are, you're already defeated. He doesn't even have to fight you. And I made a a uh, statement I said when that is the state of a man when he comes for deliverance and we lay hands and should we ask that spirit who are you the spirit to call your name because you become your own demon you become the reason for your own oppression the devil does not have to fight you when you believe that you can't make it he doesn't have to fight you he would have successfully colonized you <laughs> hallelujah and then at that point he doesn't even have to fight the inverse of it is also true when God works on the mind of a believer, the man can get to a state where God doesn't have to do so many things in your life again. You are now equipped. You can now sustain certain things. You don't need certain impartations anymore. You now become an educated spirit, an enlightened spirit. You begin to have a say. God begins to interfere less and less in your life and begin to hold you more and more accountable. Hallelujah. And we observe from Genesis chapter 1 and then chapter 3 that when God created Adam and Eve, the first thing he gave them, he said, let us make man in our own image and likeness. The first thing God considered that was important for man to have was that man should carry his image and that man should be in his likeness that is in function. And that when the devil came to Eve in chapter 3 of Genesis, the first thing he also attacked subtly verse 1 of chapter 3 of genesis the bible tells us that the serpent was more subtle than all the creatures that god had made and the devil came like that and spoke with eve and said did god really say and i say that the devil comes so subtly like that he creeps on you without you knowing to the point that if you were not discerning you would not recognize that you are in the presence of an adversary you will not recognize that you are in the presence of a beastly creature someone who is out to destroy you you would imagine that that question was for educational purposes you would find out that you would think that the devil wanted to learn as well you would think that he perhaps wanted to also obey the same instruction no he was actually attacking the identity of eve and this we saw in the preceding events and how that she noticed or she believed that the fruits will make her like God, of which she was already made in his likeness and image. You see that? And then again, she, she observed the fruit and said it is desirable to make one wise. And we said at what point 
Did her communication with the devil inform her that she was a fool or that she was lacking in wisdom? What the devil had successfully attacked was her image. And I made a powerful statement and I'll repeat it. I said, the moment you lose identity, you would lose dominion. And I showed you from the seven sons of Sceva and how the Bible gave us insight into what was happening. He introduced them as the sons of Sceva. And I told you that Sceva was not a name to reckon with in spiritual matters. So the demon simply asked them one question. Who are you? And their failure to answer that question made dominion to be taken from them. They lost power over that situation. When the devil attacks you, really, he's attacking the image that you have of yourself. Hallelujah. And we observed all those and how the devil comes quietly through your background, through where you came from, through the words of mentors that you've had over the years, through experiences, through limitations, through failures of your own. He attempts to inform you or present a certain narrative to you that is different from what God said. And we said any image you have of yourself that is different from the picture that God has, it is what we refer to as a broken self-image. It is altered, it has been distorted, and the, the, the consequence are much. Hallelujah. So tonight we will journey from there. First Samuel chapter 7 verse 1. Now look at this. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Sukkot, which belonged to Judah and pitched between Sukkot and Azekah in I don't want to pronounce that word, alright? Next verse. <laughs> Next verse, Ephes that mean, all right? And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. Next verse. Watch this. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side and there was a valley between them. Next verse. So the Bible is giving us the context of the scenario. And there went out a champion. Watch this out of the camp of the Philistines, named what? Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. That's about, <laughs> that's about 10 feet. In case you don't understand, let me put it in perspective. That's from this floor to, to the top there. So when, when the man came out, his sight is intimidating. And, and then, uh, next verse. Look at this. What is it about Goliath? And, uh, and he had a helmet of brass upon his head. Helmet, a brass is a, is, a, is a heavy metal, all right? A helmet of brass on his head. And he was armed with a coat of mail. Of mail. That's also irons. Made of irons. This guy is dressed in something really heavy. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. This is about 15 kilograms. Next verse. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs. That's like shin guards now. All right. And a target of brass between his shoulders. I know you may not understand this. Next verse. Ah. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. Beam means pillar. His spear was the head was like a pillar. So it was yay big. <laughs> Hallelujah. You see, when they throw that kind of spear at you, it doesn't puncture you. It will hit you and then tear you. <laughs> Hallelujah. It will be like the, the, a, a, a vehicle jammed you. So, so that the man could throw that kind of thing. Is, is <laughs> and it weighed 600 shackles of iron. And, uh, and one bearing a shield went before him. His shield was so big and heavy that somebody else had to carry the shield for him and follow him. Next verse. Notice how intimidating this guy is. And he stood and cried out unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in Ari? Am not I a Philistine and ye servants of Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. You see, they, they, they came out armies and armies. And then this tall guy came out. 
and I could get to imagine their commander was saying, all right, so this is what we'll do. We're going to allocate 15 men to this guy. Immediately the battle starts, you, 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 attack only him. You know when you play football and the opposing team have a very good player, you will tackle him specially. Is that true? You want to tackle him specially. You say, okay, three, two defenders to this person. <laughs> so the demand said, there's no point for bloodshed. I'm just a man like you. He said, send out one man. Just one man. Next verse. We will change the rules of war in this battle. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me. He didn't say if he put my back on the ground. <laughs> and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. Next verse. Just words were spoken, but really, is it just words? And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Next verse. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistines, they were what? Dismayed and greatly afraid. Give us this in message translation. Hmm. When Saul and his troops heard the Philistines' challenge, they were terrified and lost all hope. Why? They saw the visage of the man. That man looked like a beast. He was a giant. Just the armor he carried. Verse 16. Let's jump a few verses. Then David is introduced and the Philistines drew near morning and evening and presented himself how many days? 40 days he kept at it. Every morning they wore their armor, came out to war and they drew lines. And he came out and repeated the same thing and nobody would challenge him. Hmm. Verse 23. Let's just keep a lot of verses. So Jesse sends David to go and check on his brothers who were fighting. And the fighting really they were doing was just coming out to line up and stand. And be, each one would tell them, go out now. Bro. You are the strongest. He said, no. Me? He said, go out now. You are the commander. You are in charge. He said, ah, no. When you read this story, you will see that Saul was not even in this place. They had to carry David to go and meet him somewhere else. Saul was far from that battle. <laughs> he was far from the battle. I want to show you something. And as he talked with them, that's David now, he's talking in the camp. There came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. Woo! Say, David heard them. David heard them. Next verse, look at this. And all the men of Israel when they saw the man, did what? They fled from him and were very afraid. Next verse. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that is come up surely to defy Israel? This is the next verse. All right. And it shall be that the man, this is the next verse. That's verse 24. Okay, it's, it's correct. All right, all right, it's okay. Hmm. Next verse. Let's just skip this verse. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killed this Philistine? What did David know? That he hearing that, he did not see death. He did not see his obituary. He saw an opportunity. He said, what will be done to the man that kills this man? Let's keep all these verses. Verse 40. You know how he went to Saul and Saul said, who are you? And he introduced himself again. You know? How he wore Saul's armor and said, no, I can't use that. 
So now this is David now going up. Remember they had described how Goliath looked like from his helmet to his shield to his spear to his sword to his armor bearer that carried his shield. Now look at David. Here comes David. And he took his staff. It's not like Moses' staff that parts water out. This one doesn't perform miracles. <laughs> this is a shepherd's stick. He took his staff in his hand and chose him five. Woo-hoo. Five. Smooth. <laughs> when you want to stone somebody, you don't look for smooth stones. You should look for rough, heavy stones. He looked for a smooth one. <laughs> Well, maybe it was a question of aerodynamics. <laughs> Out of the brook and put them in his shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a script. That's like a small side bag. And his sling was in his hand. And he drew near to the Philistines. While others were drawing back, he was moving close. Next verse. <laughs> and the Philistine came on and drew near unto David. And the man that bare the shield went before him. Next verse. So these are two men walking towards David. And when the Philistine looks about and saw David, he what? He disdained him. He was angry. He despised him. Why? For he was a youth. He was ruddy. Hey. And of a fair countenance. He looked handsome. <laughs> He did not have the visage of a soldier. His eyes did not look fierce. He looked like an Ajebo person. He didn't look like someone who had suffered. He didn't look like someone who was trained. He looked rude. He was a youth. Goliath was a veteran. The Bible says he had been fighting from his youth. From his old way, he was a little boy. He was fighting. The Bible made us understand that David at this point was but 17 years old. He was, he was a handsome looking I could imagine him on his jeans. Whatever is the, is the fashion of today, right? <laughs> as crazy as this, that's how he showed up. He rejected the outfit that Saul gave him. His appearance irritated Goliath. And I could imagine everybody that day was standing in shock and wondering what was about to happen. If you, if you moved, everybody's attention will turn to you. There was absolute silence. Next verse. Kai. And the Philistines said unto David, Am I a dog? <laughs> Woo! There, there is a way your, your approach is honoring the devil. You should approach the devil as though he's a dog. Hallelujah. Yes. Some of you wait until when we announce 21 day fasting before you confront some things. The day God blesses you and you took yourself out and ordered some chicken or whatever it is that you like and you ate. When you are done, you stand up from there and say, where's the devil now? Yes. Yeah. Not, not, not in the time when you, you, you see, you see when, when we go 21 days back it's so that we may be with the Lord so that we may be with the Lord it's not for the devil oh. you see when, when, when Daniel fasted 21 days he was talking to God who, he was talking to God the moment information came to him that there was a prince of Pasha somewhere that battle ended that day This will be your state after this teaching tonight. He said, am I a dog? Please, if we are the host of Israel, what would we call us to that question? Yes, absolutely, he is a dog. He's a dog. You see, you see, Jesus referred to a Gentile in one place and said, should we give the children's bread to who? To dogs. He said, am I a dog that thou comest to me with sticks? And the Philistine did what? Look at this. He cursed David by what? His gods. That tells you that that battle was not just one of swords. The real battle happening was one of words. 
The first time that battle started, the Bible tells us that the children of Israel were afraid and terrified. On the 40th day, they were running. The man will come out and talk and then they will flee. He had conditioned them with his words. He had altered their image to the point that when they looked at themselves, it was like the time of Joshua, where men said, we are but grasshoppers. He says, we saw the sons of Anak there. In their eyes, we were like grasshoppers. In our eyes, we were like grasshoppers. He says, we can't, we can't confront these people. And he cursed David by his gods. It's a spiritual warfare that you are in. People may be contending with you physically, but I assure you, they've taken the battle spiritual. They've taken the battle spiritual. Yes, ago I preached a message and titled it Switch. And I said you must learn to, to, there are certain triggers God has given us in this kingdom that you can switch from one level of warfare to another. From one level. And you see for us when we go higher in warfare, what we are doing is going deeper in grace. Not, we are not intensifying activity. When we are in intense warfare, we don't talk much anymore. Hallelujah. So you switch. You see, a pigeon can be on the ground near you and it's just eating, eating, picking stuff. And you can want to catch it and to just move and look at you. You might want to move and you think that you are so close till you try to dive and catch it. And once it takes off, that's all. You yourself, you know that the battle is over. You cannot pursue it. You need to see when an eagle fights with a snake. It will just pick him up from the ground. And that's all. To a different terrain. The devil will always try to cause you to bring the battle to the physical. Let's make it about our qualifications. Let's make it about the quality of our English. Moses wanted to make that mistake. He said, God, you have to send somebody else because I'm not eloquent. He mistook it because God told him, he said, go and tell Pharaoh. To let my people go. So he thought it was just mere words. He said, no now. I'm a stammerer. And I told you that last week that he missed the sign. God was actually talking to him through a tree that doesn't even talk in the first place. But yet God was talking to him through a burning bush. And then here he was stammering. Hallelujah. You must learn to switch when the devil comes against you. You must learn to raise a standard against him. Hallelujah. I made a statement and let me finish that statement. I said, when we intensify battle, we are going deeper in grace. We are not increasing activity. Hallelujah. In other words, when the devil came, I can start praying and fasting. When the devil takes the battle to another level, there is a place the battle will get to. I will sit down. Hallelujah. Are you hearing me? There is a place when the battle gets to, when it's too hot, I will hands up and say, Lord, I've left it for you. I'm going deeper in grace. Because when God rises to take over from me, it's finished. There's no battle again. There's no battle. At the blast of his nostrils, they see a parted. Hmm. Next verse. And the Philistines said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. The battle of words is going on again. Next verse. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me. <laughs> he says, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, whom thou hast defied. He said that, I'm, I'm defying the armies of Israel. He said, David, come, I will, I will feed your, your flesh to the beds of the earth. David sh shifted base of the battle. He says, I come against you in the name of the Lord whom you've defied. This battle is not between me and you. It's now the Lord's battle. You must learn to invoke the Lord into, into a battle. You are fighting too much on your own. Too much. You must learn to allow God to rise up on your behalf. The Bible calls him the Lord of Heaven's armies. He commands an army. He's the Lord of hosts. He's mighty. He's terrible in battle. 
He's a seasoned warrior. He says, I come against you in his name. Jesus had not yet given us that name, but David knew something. He said, he said I call in the name of the Lord. <laughs> he knew something. He knew something. The name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Next verse. This day, he said, if you do 40 days, this day we will settle this matter. Some of you, the devil has raged free from the days of your great grandfather through the days of your grandfather to the days of your father. But in your days, you will bury that enemy. Better shout amen if you believe it. There are generational problems that will end with you. We are there that breach the gap. We breach the gap. It doesn't matter the kind of affliction that has raged on. When it reaches your turn, it ends. It ends. And you will not even honor the devil to the point of giving him a, a, a long fight. It will just end. Pack up your things and get out of here. The Bible tells us that when Jesus triumphed over the devil, he did so publicly. He made a public show of them. There was no honor given to the devil in that fight. He didn't get the chance to throw some punches. After the devil finished making noise that he was going to dethrone God, mobilized an army. When Michael came to fight him, he didn't give him the benefit of a, of, of a sword fight. <laughs> they stood and the devil was like, ah! And Michael just said, I rebuke you in the name of the Lord. And for some reason, the devil found himself running. He just couldn't figure out why. His programming took, off, took control of the situation. I began to flee. He says, resist him. He will flee. He will flee. David said, this day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand. He said, you think you brought yourself here. No, you are the delivery package. You were sent to me. It's not about you. It's, it's what will be done to the man that kills you. That, that's what this is about. That's what is being delivered. You are packaged. The blessing was packaged in the... If you see the package, you see the right Goliath. <laughs> it was way built through him. You know when you buy something, you will see the right Amazon, the right... The package was Goliath. Some of you, the problems in your life, that's just what it is. It's a package. It's a blessing that is there. It's a blessing that is there. You may call it sickness. No, no, it's a blessing that is there. As you begin to engage that sickness and defeat it, what you will come out from there is not just a healing, it's an anointing. So it is actually a packaged something there. It says, and I will, and I will smite thee. Oh, and take thy head <laughs> from thee. And while he was saying this, he didn't have a sword in his hand. He came with a stone and a belt. A javelin. He says, today I will take off your head. And I will give thy carcass to the host of the Philistines. And I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines rather. This day unto the fowls of the air. And to the wild beasts of the earth. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. You must learn to qualify your battle. Somebody tried to say today I will show you that there is a God living inside me. You are switching the battle. You are changing it's guys that will understand this thing. When we were younger, we used to play a game called Mortal Kombat. <laughs> there are some co codes when you press, you will change the world. <laughs> you will change the world. Then in that place, you begin to do some things. Brutality and fatality. Sisters in the house, I know you don't understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> you, you change the world. You change the rules of engagement. The devil comes as a fish. We take the battle to the air. <laughs> if, if, if it comes on land, we, we take it to the sea. You see, we can do business in deep waters. We can do it. So any side you come from, we are ready. If you come with tuning and craftiness, we have it. We have it too. If you come with wisdom, we have it. 
<laughs> Next verse. Just be churches and say, there is a God in Israel. Put your name there. Yeah. One more time, beat your chest. Say, there is a God in Israel. Yeah. There's a God inside you. Sometimes we forget, and that's what the devil, all, all, this, um, all this show the devil is doing, that's what it's about. He wants to distract you. He wants to prevent you from seeing that there's a God inside you. He wants you to be thinking that you are alone. He wants you to fight the battle alone. He wants to corner you. He came out and said, eh, if, if, send out one soldier to come and fight me alone. But he came out, he came with the names of his gods and all the soldiers of Israel forgot. Till David. David said, there's a God in Israel. Hmm. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saved not with sword and with spear. Not even with stone or javelins or, or slings. He says, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. In the physical we fight. In the spiritual it is given. Victory is given. Victory is not something we contend for. Victory is something we receive. We receive victory the way we receive healing. Yes. We receive victory the way we receive a miracle. By faith. In the Lord. The battle is the Lord. No matter how small the battle is always qualified and say God this is a God problem. This is your problem. This is your problem. Father, this is your problem. Say, I refuse to fight alone. That's number one. Number two, I refuse to fight in the flesh. Yes. The two are not mutually exclusive. If you fight in the flesh, you fight alone. It's true. When you fight with the Lord, the battle is his. It's formality we are doing. All that attack is just formality. The battle is the Lord. He said to me. Next verse. Let's see what happened. And it came to pass. Woo! Say it came to pass. You see, because David had spoken his own reality already. So now what he said now came to pass. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David. See how the, the, the Philistine arose and he's coming. He's drawing near. He's walking. What did David do? He says, David hasted and ran towards the army to meet the Philistine. We like this coming. David is running. In his mind, we are not guessing these things. We know, we know it is a settled matter. We know how it ends. We know how it ends. I will drag anything with anybody. If the Lord gives it, that's all. It doesn't matter how tall you look. It doesn't matter how fat. It doesn't matter how many are in the host of that person. You see, in this kingdom, we don't fight with numbers. God doesn't have to send 10 angels. One angel can do what 1,000 angels will do. The number is, is for prophetic uh, reasons. When it comes to the final day of rapture, it's one angel that will come and just shout just one archangel. And we will metamorphose. We will change. We will, this body will change. Dust to dust. There will be no dust that day. We will change. Instantly. Instantly. It doesn't matter whether the world is ready for it or not. We will be changed. And it doesn't matter whether gravity likes it or not. We will begin to, we will, we will begin to ascend. The way Jesus ascended that day. And the clouds received him. That's how we will just be changed. Bam. We did a twinkle of an eye. Just an angel will shout. Just his shout. Then if, if God speaks, come on. You see why God is allowing you to do the battle? Because if God steps in, it's a bit, you know, it's, it's kind of unfair. <laughs> it's unfair. So it gives you the privilege of rebuking the devil instead on his behalf. Hallelujah. Yeah. Next verse. Oh, I see people running towards their problems from today. Because something will shift inside you. Suddenly you realize that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. 
And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and sling it and smote the Philistine in his forehead. That the stone sunk. Sinking is not associated with heads. Sinking happens in water. <laughs> you don't, you don't, you don't, something doesn't hit your head and sink. <laughs> it's a spirit thing. It entered. If you were sensitive that you would have had pew, it entered. <laughs> it just entered. It sank in. This sinking implies that the, the helmet made no difference. That it was made of brass. Because it was a sinking something. I wish there was a professor of physics to give us more insights what was happening here. <laughs> Maybe we'll learn something more, you know? <sighs> and he fell upon the face, uh, upon his face to the earth. I see giants falling. In the name of Jesus, none will be able to stand in front of you. No enemy would be able to stand in front of you. If they gather against you, they will scatter in seven directions. In the name of Jesus. Last verse. Let's finish it up. Verse 50. That's, yeah, 50. I think that's the last verse. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. He cut off that head. He carried Goliath's sword and cut out his own head. It was a bloody affair. <laughs> this is not the kind of action film you like to watch. You want them to fight a bit. Let the last fight be tough. In this kingdom, the last fight is instant. If we act a real spiritual Christian movie for you. The last fight, we are more than conquerors. Conquerors don't fight. We just decree, it's over. We just decree. Just say, hey, fall. And it, it's gone. It's gone. When you understand the principle I'll teach you tonight, the devil will begin to run from you. Mm. He will, he will start making sure that people don't meet you because you are now the solution yourself. You are now, you are now the deliverance. You are a walking, breathing deliverance. You are a walking, breathing, living, healing. The Bible says he quickens our spirits. He makes us alive and active. We are dispensing life as we move. You become a life giver. You would begin to perform more miracles unaware than you are aware. Last week we observed how that um, God is both omnipotent two weeks back, omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient. And we said although God is omnipresent, meaning he's everywhere, yet he still comes and still goes. Hallelujah. Although he's everywhere, he still comes to a place and leaves that place. He's everywhere, so God is where he's going to. And God is still where he has left. So it's a mystery of God. Because when we begin to say we are created in his likeness and image, those attributes too, to a level, are captured in us. Hallelujah. We said that God is omnipotent, meaning he has all power and can do all things. And he lives inside of you. Yet, your ability grows. Yet, your ability seems to be limited. Hallelujah. And then we said God is omniscient. Yet when you read your Bible closely, you will find God exhibitory, exhibiting an attribute where he is becoming aware of things. Where he would say, and the cry of the children of Israel reached him. All right, Where he would say to Abraham, I want to go and check Sodom and Gomorrah and see if it is like I was told. And yet he knows all things. But yet he's going. God knows all things, yet he still requires you to pray and tell him your problems. Yet he already knows it. So also with us. There is a level of his omnipotence, omnipresence and omniscience that is invested in us. And as we continue to grow and become more like him, we begin to see these dimensions more and more. 
When the Bible described it, he said it was the shadow of Peter that was healing people. When you look at it in the eyes of the Spirit and really understand what is happening there, it was the presence of Peter that was healing people. It had nothing to do with the reflection of him blocking the rays of the sun from hitting another person. It had nothing to do. You, we do not have to you know, reposition the shadow. Oh, where's my shadow? Then I come like this. No, it's not necessary. The presence, the circumference. We see that in the life of Samuel. When Samuel was in, uh, was not that place now, Rama. When Saul would send people to arrest him or to find David, when they came close, they began to prophesy. When Saul himself came, the Bible says he removed his clothes and was prophesying himself too. He had such an atmosphere that you didn't have to meet him once you were just inside that circumference. That's why you come to church like this and you find out that there's precision in your thoughts. Is that true? Many of you have observed that when you are in church, that's when business ideas come. And then sometimes you, you rebuke it because you think it's a distraction. No. It's your spirit leveraging on an atmosphere that the, 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 the leadership of that church have cultivated through their lives, through the corporate anointing. They've cultivated it in that place. So when you sit down there, there's precision of thoughts. If I were you, that's the best time to call to remembrance some of the difficult situations in my life. I say, Lord, what do I do about this situation? This business is not moving. How do we move it? And you may think it's distraction, but yet you are in the presence, you are in an atmosphere where there's an omniscience, there's an extra knowledge being made available that you can begin to access. Hallelujah. Hmm. Building a healthy self-image. Are we being blessed already? All right. How do we do that? How do we get to that place like David where he looked at Goliath and did not see that tall giant with a sword, with a shield, with all those things? How did he look at Goliath? What did he know that made him have a, have a different response to that situation? Hallelujah. There's a lie we believe that we use to justify certain things where we say, if you were in my shoe, you will do the same thing. It's not true. The only reason I will do the same thing is if I see myself the way you see yourself. Notice, the way we see ourselves would define what we even consider to be a problem. The very thing you call a problem, somebody has worse than that and is sleeping. Is at peace. He's in perfect peace. You could imagine Saul or Paul rather being stoned to death. People don't stone you and assume you are dead. You can't pretend when we are stoning you. A stone can't hit you and say, oh, let me pretend like I'm dead. Maybe they'll soon stop. No. If you are dead, it's because you died. If they think you are dead, it's because you died. Then after all that thing, everybody walks away. The man stood up, just dusted himself, went back into the city. He said, where did I stop? What was, let's do part two now. <laughs> I was teaching you on the grace of God. Now let's do part two. Hmm. What made him feel like that was not a deliverance for him to run away? He said, ah, God, thank you. I made a mistake. I shouldn't have come to this city. You didn't send me. And then run away. He said, Lord, I will not make this mistake again. No, no, no. He went back to that situation. And of course, they didn't stone him the second time. Hallelujah. You need to learn to see yourself the way God sees you. If you see how God sees you, you would see why God is not bothered about your life the way you are bothered about it. Because the way God is looking at you like this, you can solve your problem. Did you hear me? The way God is looking at you like this. What did I say? You can solve your problem by yourself. The concept of destiny helpers is not just to, 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 to fill up for your inabilities. It is to express the reality of being members of a body. 
where we depend on each other. That I'm called to be a prophet does not mean I'm isolated from the pastoral anointing. It's so that I can attain to mastery. It's so that I can be specialized, sharp, in my calling for the sake of the body of Christ. And when God brings a destiny helper, it's so that I can leverage on that for speed and for rest. So that I can focus on other things. It is not because I am incapacitated. It is not because I cannot do anything about my situation. As if to suggest that in me, that dimension is not captured. It's not true. I, did you understand that description? God brings destiny help us for those reasons. It is not because you can't. Hmm. When you see yourself, how God sees you, the Bible says, arise and shine. Did you notice the statement? Arise and what? And shine. One more time, what? Arise and shine. He didn't say, stretch your hand, let me lift you up. Come on, church. Who should arise? You. Who should shine? You. The, the reason why we are like that is because we have not seen ourselves as God sees us. And the Bible says, let every man be a lie. And let God alone be what? Be true. What God sees and says about you is the real thing. If somebody says, I'll beat you. I say, no, you cannot. It's not, you cannot. He says, I'll deal with you. I say, no, you cannot. You cannot. The worst that can happen is that you provoke me to now deal with you. Hallelujah. Why? When you see, when you are able to, to see something. Alright? So, when it comes to the building of that image, we must seek to do so from two standpoints. Internally and externally. But most times we tend to be distracted by what is happening on our outside. I gave you an example last week on how someone can be crying on account of a broken self-image that is not aware of and be worried because somebody said you were stingy. You now went to your brother, to your sister, to your friend and you say, see, am I, am I stingy? And I said, the problem is not that somebody said you were stingy. The problem is that something within you believes it. Something within you is not sure. Because if you were so sure, then whatever the person said, your response would just be, that is your opinion. Someone tells you, oh, you are not fine. You don't look, you are not beautiful. You just say, well, that's your opinion. And I'm sorry you think that way. I really feel bad that you think that way. I'm sorry. Really. You would not be sh shifted by such words. When Goliath comes and threatens like that, you are, fear is not the response that come up, comes up within you. It's something else. When you truly have a better image of who you are, you begin to find out that even sin and temptation begins to lose form. It begins to lose power. You now begin to find out that you can walk away from certain places. Hallelujah. Praise God. All right. So now, how do you begin to take control of the formation of the perception of who you are? Externally, number one, what you begin to do is surround yourself with people that are not always attacking your self-image. There are people who would constantly insult, constantly criticize, constantly yab and attack the image that you have of yourself. Hallelujah. Yeah. If we 
close the door and window, will it adjust the sound? Will it affect it? We are all serving God. There's no need to be trying to dominate the airways. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. 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 Hallelujah. So try not to be distracted, okay? Try and still focus. Nothing will take away your blessing tonight. Said, surround yourself with people that are not constantly attacking your self-image. That's number one. Number two. Another thing is, you see, the same way people try to shape how you see yourself is the same way there are people in your life that you too um, have the privilege of adjusting how they see themselves. And if you're one of such people in such positions, are parents. Hallelujah. Parents have a wonderful assignment to build and influence a child's perception of himself. So do teachers, pastors, elder siblings, friends, really everybody. Hallelujah. I'm saying that to you here because in the future you would um, you would raise a family if you don't already have one. Take charge of the formation of their perception of themselves. Help them to see themselves as God sees them. Don't just tell them that mommy loves you. Mommy supports you. Daddy loves you. Tell them that God loves them. Show them who they are. Sit your sons down and make sure they have a healthy self-image. Hallelujah. Yes. You see, before I got so much confidence in God's word, my mother's words was what sustained me. As tall as I look right now, in primary school, I was constantly bullied. Constantly. Constantly bullied. Forget that now I look like the bully. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> then I was the person that was bullied. I'd been insulted because of my complexion. And funny enough, when I got to think of it and see certain pictures from school, I realized I was not the darkest in the class. But somehow they just picked on me and said my, I was black. Hallelujah. Yeah, and, it, and, and they talk about the size of my head. But today, I don't think there's ever been a more perfect head than this. <laughs> there can never be. It can never be. It's either your head fits you the way mine fits me. <laughs> or, <laughs> or something else. Hallelujah. Yes. So before I found out God saying that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And before I discovered Songs of Songs chapter 4 verse 7. Before I discovered that, it was the words of my mother. My mother said to me I was handsome. And that's it. Isn't it? You cannot know more than my mother. <laughs> you cannot. So you have that privilege to shape the mind of the child. And then you know what? Don't just do it. Let it not be hinged on you. Because somewhere in teenage, when, when they are teenagers, they start losing some confidence in you as a parent. They start to argue with you. They start to see some of your human side and they begin to argue with you. So make sure you hinge it on God's word. So that when your sons and daughters enter a place, nobody, nobody, nobody can just sway your daughter because he told her she's beautiful. He said, ah, you are beautiful, you are African queen. There's nobody like you. She may not be rude, but if the person is, does not look like Christ, her response would be, I know. You'll be like, wow, so you see it too. Oh, I'm surprised it took you so long to notice. Oh, I know. As fathers, you must be the one to call out the women, the ladies in your daughters. Call out the men in your children, in your boys. Call out the man. Let the man come out with boldness. 
Let him come out with confidence. Let him come out ready to face the world. No child, whether yours or not, should grow in your house and sustain a low self-esteem. None of them. Each of them should be confident. Yes. They should be ready. You should be able to, like Manoa, to ask, what, where is this child coming? How do we train him? What is peculiar to his upbringing or her upbringing? And you train them like that in the way of the Lord. You groom them from birth to be a governor, to be a president, to be an inventor, to be a minister. You groom them like that. You carefully shape them. So that when they show up, their battle is, is minimal. It's so minimal. The Holy Ghost doesn't have to spend so much time trying to renew their mind. Their mind, is, it, has been, it has been carefully packaged and constructed. Yes. There's a way royalties are raised. I think one service we will look into that and communicate it to us so that we would see how we can influence the little children. Whereby you are not teaching them to become bullies or arrogant. You are training them in a way that they realize they are so powerful. But they realize that they are created to defend the weak. Not to oppress the weak. Hallelujah. So don't be the reason why someone feels inferior. Partner with the Holy Ghost to redeem the world. Hallelujah. All right. Another way is learn to celebrate small victories. This is another thing that has affected our image. You feel you are not so successful because you are just waiting on that big thing to happen. Meanwhile, every day you are killing the lion and the bear. Every day you are, you are successfully pulling down uh, uh, the, the, the oppositions that come against you. But you've just put up your mind on one thing, maybe like marriage. You say, Lord, I must settle down. And yet every day God is working out miracles in your life. And you've refused to smile or celebrate because you just think marriage. Whilst every day you had a dream that came to pass, you didn't celebrate it. You accurately discerned something. That's not a smart thing. It's not a smart thing. Learn to put value on those small things. It helps you. Look at David's basis for confronting Goliath. He said the same way God delivered the lion and the bear. He said the same way Goliath will be delivered, delivered into my hands. So you've been, you've been neglecting your source of strength. Those little victories every day. You open your Bible, you receive the revelation that it was not your pastor, it was not anybody that preached, it was not a book. You received it from God. Come on now. Celebrate that. You prayed for someone to be healed and he was healed. Somebody told you, oh, I'm going for an exam. I've not really read. Please pray for me. I've not prepared like I should. I prayed with a person. The person came back. Oh, how was it? I said, ah, it was so simple. You should celebrate God. When you celebrate those little, little things, your heart trusts more in God. Jesus kept asking his disciples. He says, where is your faith? Where is your faith? Because every time he performed a miracle, they forgot about it. They did not call it to remembrance. The children of Israel as well. He said, can God fashion a table in the wilderness? They forgot that he parted the Red Sea. They forgot what he did in Egypt. I promise you, no matter how big a gate is, the key is always small. It's always small. So the faith that comes from that little thing, you would be amazed. Is that small faith like a monster seed that is required to move that mountain? Yes. Where you felt headache, you say, Kai, no, I will not take Panadol today. Father, I command this headache to leave. And it left. That faith should steer you up enough for you to walk into a room where there's a cancer patient. And you say, the same God that took away that headache will take away this cancer because it's the same thing. It's only your place that there are levels. David said God does not require a, a, a knife and spear to fight. The size does not matter to God. The size of the affliction. I don't care whether the demon is a high-ranking one or a small-ranking devil. 
I'm not sure if there's a devil higher than the devil himself. But if there was a devil higher than the devil himself, it's the same strategy, it's the name of Jesus. Every knee is every knee. Every tongue is every tongue. So I come against you in the name of the Lord. You must learn that. Hmm. Learn to celebrate small victories. Are you with me? Celebrate it enough to consider yourself a success. You say, Woo, I've made it. And you're wondering, ah, how much just entered? It's only one key. It's one key. Miracle mm-hmm. allows one key. Or you did a work, one key. The same way the grace on your life produced a thousand naira, it will produce a million naira. You are neglecting it. That's why it's not working. It's true. It's true. The same way you finish primary school, that's how you finish the university. It's the same you. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. The same way you've overcome. Do you know since when you started winning? Science students, help me. When, When it comes to reproduction in biology now, and they tell you that the, the, the sperm is going to fertilize the egg. They say, how many sperms are running towards there? How many? In millions, right? You competed with, million, with over a million people. And you came first. There's no class that is too big. There's no class. If coming first position matters to you, take it. Be the best in the class. If, it, if that is what you want, take it. If you want to be the best in your industry, be it. You're already a modern conqueror. Let the energy, the faith that comes from the small victories propel you to what you think. The thing is that we don't really see the level of opposition in the spirit. That's why. Sometimes you might see a cancer in somebody's body and all that is happening is a natural deformity based on what the person is eating maybe bad eating habits a lot of canned things and so there's a cancer and yet you laid hands on somebody who had a headache and you don't know that that day what you chased out was the spirit of death you don't know that what came on that person was a generational problem that wanted to kill him and as small as you are with your small self you put your hand on the person and said it is well and God honored it so, but because you think headache is popular, so it's small. Or the medical bills on headache is not that expensive, so it must be a small thing. No. Learn to see by the eye of the Spirit. Learn to see by the eye of the Spirit. You're bigger than you know. You must learn to stop blaming yourself for things that are outside your control. Some of us like to blame ourselves for everything. Somebody uh, leaves you and you keep blaming yourself. Somebody cheats you. Somebody lies to you. Somebody, you keep blaming yourself. Bad things happen. Somebody dies. And you allow the devil to whisper to you that it is your fault. Maybe as a pastor. said, if you are more prayerful, this member would not have died. No. Forgive yourself for all those things. And stop blaming yourself. Hallelujah. I may be the watchman, but I'm only watching because he's watching. If I slept, he did not sleep. Are you with me? So allow yourself to heal. Learn to identify toxic places, people, materials as well. There are toxic materials, some songs, movies, books, that focus so much on defeat, on fears, and even on pain without a remedy. You see, personally, I don't like horror movies. It's pointless to me. It steers up an emotion that I don't need. I don't need to be. What's the fear for? You finish watching a horror film. Sorry, I don't know the names of them or that called one. You finish watching a horror movie. Now, to go to your own toilet is a problem. You are in a bad state. In a bad state. You finish watching a horror film and you want to cross the road. Now, the kind of images in your head. And some of you wonder why you have bad dreams at night. 
my imagination does not know how to conceive an accident. I'm telling you. If something bad is going to happen to you, God will have to show me in a way that is... It's never complete. Maybe can, if there's going to be an accident, I can see two cars coming like this and then the vision ends. It never hits. You know the way the Bible says God's eye is holy and he sees no evil. With all the evil in the world that he's seen everything, yet he says his eyes doesn't see evil. He cannot behold iniquity. Salah. So learn to identify those toxic things that affect the state of your faith. I was saying to Benai, I said, one of the things as a man of God you must always do is ensure that you are ready at every time. So that when you are called upon to confront the enemy, you should not be the one under attack. You should not be called to pray for a sick or dying person and you are, what is going on in your mind is like, do you remember you did not pray today? Do you remember what you did in the afternoon? Yeah, yeah the one is it's unnecessary. It's unnecessary. You should not be the one. Be ready always. So protect yourself from all those things. It's unnecessary. I should not come to preach to you now. Then I'll now be. There's now a battle going on within me. Like you are the one preaching like this. You after what you did. No, don't do those things. Save yourself the stress. Hallelujah. Yes. <laughs> I said I want to close early today, so let's hurry. And then be bold enough to do something about demeaning places, places that attack your self-image. Some you will address, note this, some you will walk away from, and then some you will build a strong resolve around that situation. It's not every place that is toxic. You know this thing going on in our time? Mental health, oh, my mental health, my mental health. It's good though. But it's not every time you leave that place. You can't leave every toxic place Hallelujah. Some places the toxic people have to leave. They are not the ones that will leave. You see, when we are in the promised land, we don't, we don't remove our leg from there. <laughs> the Lord gives you understanding. And then also we must handle it internally. Internally, number one, you must forgive yourself. We saw that last week. Do we remember? Mark chapter 12, verse 31. You must forgive yourself for mistakes, for shortcomings, for habits, for being slow in certain things. Maybe you feel, oh, if I had done this years ago, my life would have been better now. Perhaps you exhibited foolishness in some things. You must learn to forgive yourself for that. And you must also forgive yourself for everything that you consider to be your fault. Maybe, oh, it was my fault, this and that. And the second is like Jesus had said that the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord with all your heart, all your strength, all your soul, and all your mind. And the second commandment is like this, namely this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as who? As thyself. And I'd like to ask the question then. The commandment to love yourself is number what? Is somewhere there with number one. Because as you learn to love the Lord, when you see him, I told you, you will now know who you are. Because you can only love your neighbor as you love yourself. Learn to love yourself. Learn to love your voice. Learn to love your face. There's nobody ever born that is more handsome than me. That's why I don't need to bow. I don't need to shave. If I shave, it's for your sake. I promise you. <laughs> promise you. It's, you see? Uh, you, see uh, you see this suit? It's for you and the camera. This, this, this level of expression you are seeing, if you had met me in the morning with my pajamas, you would meet the same person. It's the same person you meet. Oh. The same person. This doesn't add anything to me. It's for you. <laughs> Alright? I told you ladies, do your makeup. But learn to tell yourself, girl, you are beautiful before you do makeup. Love your real face. Hallelujah. What did I say? Love your real face. In fact, if I, if I, if I were a lady doing makeup, I would say, Kai, girl, you're too fine. Step it down. Do makeup. Just step it down. 
don't go and confuse the world today. Do you understand? They, they, they make make up version of me is lesser than the real me. Why? The real me is in the image of God. You can't be more beautiful than that. You can't be more handsome than that. I told you anybody that thinks you are not ugly, you just tell the person because you don't know God. If you knew God, you would have seen a striking resemblance. You would think we are twins. We are not twins. He is my God. I'm a filmmaker. If I'm going to ever act as Jesus, I will be the actor. I will act as Jesus. And I'll dress like me. Hallelujah. And I'll talk like me. Because that's what he looks like. Oh, this is what he looks like. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Hallelujah. Yes. And you say, I love photography. I'm a photographer also. I'll still be a photographer. I won't be a carpenter. Oh, you don't understand what I'm telling you. Yes. <laughs> you know how Jesus said, I am the door. He said, I'm the camera. I'm the camera. <laughs> and I'll bring out Let's leave that. Just watch out. Coming soon. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. And then, number two, forgive others. These are the things that alter our image. You see, when you refuse to forgive, you cannot receive healing because that wound becomes proof of your hurt. When you have let go of the offense, then there's no need for the injuries. You don't understand. There is no smoke without fire. If I remove the smoke, the fire must leave. You don't understand. We bind on earth and then heaven binds it. So when I forgive outwardly, inwardly healing comes. Because it is difficult to point to an offense or to a hurt without a culprit. Praise God. So learn to forgive others. You can't heal if you keep blaming somebody for your situation. You can't heal if you refuse to forgive. Forgiveness benefits you more than benefits the other person. I've heard somewhere that to forgive is to set a captive free, only to discover that you were that captive all along. Yeah. Number three, let no man be responsible for your faith, for your joy, for your happiness, for your health. Yes, even your mental health. Let, let it not be a man responsible for that. I have peace on the unexplainable. I have joy on unspeakable. I don't need you to make me happy. Don't need somebody to make you feel loved. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, some of you, if you learn to love yourself, a lot of the things you pursue, you stop doing it. Because you discover that you're only doing it because you're trying to make yourself acceptable. Let me prove it to you. When last did you go to the market, buy a powerful jacket if you're a guy or shoes? Or if you're a lady, you guys like all those hair? You go and buy that. You buy those fine shoes. You dressed up and you sat down to watch a movie in your house. Uh huh. So if you don't do that, that tells you you are doing it for somebody else. You are doing it for the person outside. Tell yourself you deserve good things. Yes. If you have plates or cutleries that you've kept for special guests, use that one. Eat your favorite food. If Gary is what you like, put it inside. If gote is what you like, put it inside. Sit down. Hallelujah. Some of you guys, if we find you in a restaurant, it's because you took a lady there. No, it shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. Yourself, you sit down and you, you don't even go to the counter. You 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 signal the waiter. 
Yeah. And the person comes, you are not looking down on him, you greet him well. How was your day? Wonderful. Um, what do you have? You yeah, will have it with three chickens. Yeah. And when they, you say, and whilst you're coming, put one for yourself. Do you understand what I'm telling you? I told you you're already alive. Stop working for a living. <laughs> Stop working for a living. You have pushed to the future what God has given you already. Enjoy your life now. If you can afford it, enjoy it. When you refuse to eat healthy because you are trying to save for a rainy future, the Bible calls that the labor of a fool. And it's going to wear you out. One more time. Say, I deserve good things. Do you understand? God lives inside here. God lives inside. We, we can't just be careless about it. God lives inside here. I deserve good things. Yes. Hallelujah. And if you are in a season where you are going through difficult times or difficult things, be comfortable at that level. You are not disturbed. Someone looks at you and says, you are poor. You say, I'm not poor. I'm not poor. I've learned to abound. To ab- Give us uh, Philippians 3.12. Philippians 4.12. Philippians 4.12. We'll soon close. Philippians 4.12. Philippians 4.12 Alright, look at this I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need So whether I have or I don't have if you look at me, it doesn't show my face my face is not a reflection of my bank account. My face is a reflection of my heaven's account. I'm telling you. My face is not a reflection of what I ate this morning. It's a reflection of who I am spiritually. I wear a smile. It doesn't matter what. <laughs> Look at Jesus. They came to arrest him. Peter caught somebody's ear. He said, no, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. I know you are trying to defend my honor, but no need. Don't do that. Don't do that. Ah, you, see, you see, the shocking part about this is the next verse. Give us the next verse. Philippians 4.13. Chorus it. It says, I've learned to abound and to abase. I've learned to be comfortable where there's plenty or not. But inside me, I can do all things. Forget that I'm staying poor now, trekking. I can actually buy a car. That's what it means. Forget that I don't have dinner tonight. I can actually, I, I can feed 10,000 people. Forget that, that I, I, I failed an exam. I can actually own the university. What is, then what is the meaning of all this? No, it's, it's, it's to help the people around. So that I can relate with your affliction. Oh, you don't understand. It's so that the story can be told. Oh. So that the story can be told. Hmm. Hmm. Even if I stop here, we are blessed already. Let no man be responsible. Let no situation be responsible for your joy. Be happy. Walk with the spring in your step. Hallelujah. Romans 12 verse 2. Then change your way of thinking. Romans 12 verse 2. That's all I've been teaching you. Change the way you see yourself. Learn to see yourself as God intended. And be not conformed to this world. This world will try to make you 
You see, they wrote a test. You got zero over ten. They said you are dumb. No, no, no. Do not be conformed to this world. Is that thing doesn't work on us? Do you know why sometimes you fail? So that you will not go to science class. You needed to be in art. If you had passed that test, you would have insisted. Some of you failed jam so that you will not go to school that year. You would have missed your, your, your life partner if you had gone to school that year. So, but heaven knows that when you get admission, you don't need to ask, Lord, should I go to the university or not? So the only way was for, for an angel to go and change your scores. Because you can't fail. An angel had to go and write one third. After you, you wrote jam. You went and wrote for a one third. You are crying. You can't fail. It's a strategy. It's a delay st- strategy. We are timing something in the future. <laughs> Hallelujah. The business is failing. It's paying you. No, it shouldn't pay you. We are following a script. It's just acting. It's just acting. He says, before I was, hey! He said, all my days were written in your book. So it's acting. Anybody looks down and you say, don't worry, it's acting. Tell anybody it's acting. Mm. Mm. It's acting. Hmm. Tarabasa. Terebaturubasa. But be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, perfect will of God. Next verse, verse 3. For I say through the grace given unto me, listen, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. So it's not just about saying I'm big. It's about thinking of myself according to what God has said. Notice, before this, he said your mind should have been transformed first. So when your mind is now transformed, you now think of yourself according to what God has said. It's not just talk. It's we are repeating what he has said. The Bible says he has said so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my shepherd. What can men do to me? Let me make this statement. You are not your mistakes. You might have made a mistake, but you are not your mistake. If anybody ever asks you who you are, tell the person you are a child of God. And you must even clean up yourself. Whilst you are at that moment, you say, I'm a child of God. No matter how hostile words or an environment is, maintain a strong picture of who you are. Give us 2 Corinthians 4.8. And then you remember Romans 10, 17 that says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So you are thinking of yourself according to the measure of faith. That faith came when you heard God, when God spoke to you. 2 Corinthians 4, 8. Wow, time is going. We are troubled on every side. Yet what? Not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Next verse. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. This is a scripture I'm looking for. Give me the last verse of this chapter. No matter the situation, refuse to be defined by it. Never Align to any of the stereotypes where you begin to name yourself anything that is not like God. You say, oh, I'm a failure. Me, I'm not smart. Me, I'm not fine. No, it's not true. It's not true. Whatever is not God is not true. It's not you we are talking about. And that someone tells you, you will not make it done. So who are you talking to? Hallelujah. Yeah. When you are in a room and there are 10 people, and the, someone came in and said, to, the items are finished. We just have three people to get it. You should turn and look at them and say, it's remaining two people. 
yours is settled. It's remaining two people. You people can scavenge for it. When all of you are believers, to let heaven decide. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. He's able to supply for the remaining seven. <laughs> Hallelujah. What does the last verse say? Ah, no, this is not what I'm looking for. There's a verse. Hallelujah. Second Corinthians 10, 7. We're about to close. Just a few more verses. And we're done. Okay. I think I found what I'm looking for. Second Corinthians 10, 5. Gives us a strategy. We must never forget this. 10, 5. Casting down imagination and every height in that what? Exalts itself against what? A knowledge. The knowledge of God. I'm bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So every thought contrary to God, you are arrested. The only way you can arrest a thought is by bringing a superior thought. When you do that, you are able to arrest it. He tells us this is how the weapons of our warfare functions. We are able to arrest situations. Hmm. Philippians 4.8 now gives us a yardstick on what we can, sorry I'm rushing, on what we use to judge every thought. Philippians 4.8 It says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are, what read with me, true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. These are yardsticks. Any thoughts contrary to this, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Let me show you something. You see, there's a point in time where the believer begins to get discouraged because he saw something, he thought he really heard God, and it didn't happen. So he now feels he really didn't hear God. All right, because God, he believed God told him, Go and pray for this person and he'll be healed. He went and prayed, the person didn't get healed. Maybe the person even died. He begins to feel bad. What is happening is that your mind is being transformed, your mind is beginning to capture new possibilities. There is a place in your life where your own mind cannot tell you good things, your own mind cannot tell you to go and raise the dead. Your mind will tell you that you will soon die, your mind will tell you that ah, you might die tomorrow. So, but as you're, you begin to change your mind, your mind is being transformed. You begin to now think like God. Hallelujah. You must allow yourself to grow. Whatsoever is not true, if it's not honest, if it's not just, if it's not pure, if it's not lovely, if it's not of good report, and if there's no virtue or if it's not worthy of praise, we don't say it. We don't think it. We don't think of failing and we are not afraid of failing. Did you hear what I said? The reason we are not afraid of failing is because we know how it ends. For some of you that like spoilers when you're watching a movie, you would want to ask, please, tell me how does it end? Just say, wait, this actor, the protagonist in this movie, is he going to die? You just say, no, yeah, that's what. So God has looked at your life like that. And says, I know the plans and thoughts I have for you. To give you a future and unexpected end. Your life is not a bad movie. It's a very good movie. It has an expected end. Gloriously. Hallelujah. I don't even walk about my day afraid of hell. Did you hear what I said? I don't, I don't even think it's... Let's not say some things. Alright. Last scripture. 1 Corinthians 3.18 18. 1 Corinthians 3.18 You can also write 1 Corinthians 2.16 It says we have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3.18 Let no man deceive himself. 
If any man among you seem to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. Next verse. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. You see why I told you that if you look at my life and you find it failing, it's just spirit. It's just script. Because the you would think that I would need a degree to have a happy future. It's not true. It's not true. There was a time degrees were not in existence. Men were happy before that time. Men were wealthy before that time. Don't allow the stereotypes of our world. Don't be conformed to the image of this world. Should we get A's? Yes. It's nice. It's nice. Hallelujah. Next verse. Trust the workings of God in your life. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. All right, next verse. Read to verse 23. Therefore, let no man glory in men. For what? Ah, for what? Put, put your name or say mine. All things are what? All things are. All things are. Then there's a column there. The column simply means that this statement explains what is about to come. So he listed some things. Next verse. Whether Paul, that's a human being, or Apollos, that's another human being, or Cephas, that is Peter, or what? The world, or life, or death. Can you imagine death? Death is mine. You say, let's not be talking about death. You don't understand. Death is yours. <laughs> All things are yours. The world, life, death. We give life to some and death to some. Don't you understand? When somebody has a cancer, what do we minister to the cancer, please? Is death. We curse it to die from its roots. Jesus showed us a tree refused to produce. He cursed it. You can end. He told the prophet, he said, yeah, my battle axe, I will plant and uproot some with you. You enter a place, there's a wicked man oppressing everybody. You now, that death that is yours, you begin to channel it. Hallelujah. Hmm. All things present. All things to come. All are mine. Next verse. And you are Christ's. And Christ is God's. Full stop. All things belong to God. He gave them to Christ. Christ gave them to me. Whether Paul or Apollos, whether Apostle Michael or Pastor Adam, all are mine. Then our Apostle Michael will now say, whether Pastor Emma or Prophet Israel, all are mine. You don't understand. What we are saying is that all things work it for the good of them that are called of God. All things work together for our good. There are no losses with me. I have a healthy self-image. When I move about, I own the whole world. You don't understand? I own the whole world. I can step into a bank to just to ensure that they are doing the right thing. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. You think this is good talk? It's not though. It's not good talk. I'm not trying to motivate you to go back to your small life and challenge problems. I'm trying to wake you up to a reality. Don't be too carnal about the things of this world. Don't, don't be doing one plus one who... Do you understand? Don't be looking at your profit margin and say, ah, all we are selling is, is what now? Is bonds. Eh? And it's 10, 10 era profit. How are we go? No, 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 no. It's not by power. It's not by might. It's by my spirit, said the Lord. That tells you that everything you want to do, the most important thing is not capital. It's a word from the Lord. You need a word from the Lord. 
It doesn't matter how big the issue is. Just get a word from the Lord. The word comes with the provision. That's why it's called provision. It comes after the vision. You catch the vision. The provision follows. It is, pro, it is not prevision. It's provision. What you're waiting on is a word from the Lord. Not capital. Not grant. That company, that idea. If you can see it as God intended, the resources gravitate towards it. I promise you. All things are mine. Does somebody believe that? All things are mine. Marriage, yes sir. Healing, yes sir. Wealth, yes sir. Breakthrough, yes sir. Deliverance, yes sir. All things are mine. I'm a mobile dispenser of God's grace. When I move, I move with possibilities. I'm a compendium of God's, God's attributes. When I show up, I didn't show up alone. I showed up with God. Are you with me? Yes. All things, give us back verse 22 as we close. All things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos, I don't know what's that thing that you designed in this life. Put it on that list. If it is marriage, put it there. If it is children, put it there. If it is a business, put it there. Talk to the Lord. Whatever it is, put it, say, say it is mine. And then I belong to Christ. Don't forget verse 23. And then I belong to Christ. And Christ belongs to God. All things, the earth and the fullness thereof belongs to God. It belongs to God. The cattle on a thousand hills is his. He sustains the earth. Forget that man has built a system of economy. Or he does it. All things belong to God. It is still his. What is it that you need of the Lord? Talk to God right now. Say, Lord, I lay hold on it. I lay hold on eternal life. I lay hold on abundance. What dimension are you seeking for in God? Say, I move in the prophetic. The prophetic is mine. All things are mine. All things are mine. I move in the anointings of Catherine Kuhlman. I move in an Elijah anointing. Whichever anointing is needed, that's what I move in. Oh, the world has not seen. No eye has seen. No ear has heard. No heart has conceived the things that God has in store for me. Somebody talk to God. I'm abundantly supplied for. I'm not alone. I'm not alone. No. No. I'm not alone. Somebody get angry tonight. Say, Lord, I'm tired of this situation. I choose to change it. You can be reading a book and chapter one is boring and you skip to chapter two. You say, Lord, this chapter of my life is not making sense. Let us go to chapter three. Time is relative. Shalagaba, and it came to pass. Apali atakari atakatai. I made progress. I rise like an edifice. Rakipo pos. Shiko pe petolia. Itakari anakapaposka. Eseko kani karo sata. Shalagada shalagada. My life breaks forth. My life breaks forth. Life is mine. Death is mine. 
back to your Bible to start finding prayer points. Because all the things you are praying about, God will do them. Oh, you didn't hear what I said? God will do them. So, so when we say, come for a vigil, we are going to pray 12 hours. We say, okay, what are we going to pray about? Because you don't have problems like that. You are going to spend more time talking with God than you spend talking to Him or making requests. It will be fellowship. Some of you, God will bring you to a place where you start talking to him about countries. You say, Lord, do something for Pakistan. Show yourself strong on their behalf. You now begin to truly enter the ministry of intercession. Where you see what Jesus is crying at the, at, at the mercy seat right now, this hour. I say, Lord, have mercy on the world. It's no longer about I need school fees. Let God shift you right now. In the name of Jesus. Let God shift you right now. In the name of Jesus. Some of you looking for a job, you are going to walk into the company of your choice. And, and you will create the job you want in that place. You tell them, this is what I do, this is what I bring. And this is how your life has suffered because I've not been around. But fear not, I have come. You go with a proposal. You say, let me start this department in your, in your company, in your organization. God is removing a victim mentality from you. He's giving you a conqueror's mentality. Remember, he willed the earth to you. He gave you control. Hallelujah. We trust you have been greatly blessed by this message. For more messages and information, please follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Telegram, and Twitter at Outrageous Grace Ministry. You can join in on our live broadcast every Wednesday on our Facebook page and also on Mixed LR at OGM-Radio. God bless you.